Okay, well, I think we can get started. Thank you all, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's session. This is a joint venture between Glomcon and FCURE that has continued for the last few years in their clinical trial conference series. And uh, continuing the theme of kidney transplant innovation, today's uh, talk will be is titled Harnessing the Power of Immune Tolerance in Living Donor Kidney Transplant. Uh, our speaker will be Dr. Joe, Joe Leventhal, and our panelists will be Anuja Java and Josella Delgado. Uh, my name is Sunil Yadani, and I'll be your moderator as, long with, as, as well as uh, Kristen Hood from Nefkir Kidney International. Just some brief introductions first. Dr. Leventhal is the Fowler McCormick Professor of Surgery at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He currently serves as the Director of Kidney Transplant Program, the Associate Director of Pancreas Transplantation, and as Deputy Director of the Comprehensive Transplant Center Northwestern. Dr. Leventhal received his medical degree from SUNY Downstate. He completed his surgical residency and obtained his PhD at the University of Minnesota in 1996. He completed multi-organ transplant fellowship at North Northwestern University and joined its faculty in 1997. Uh, Dr. Leventhal's current clinical interests include kidney and pancreas transplantation. He initiated the first successful laparoscopic living donor program in the Midwest in North 1997. Dr. Leventhal's clinical interests also include novel methods to expand living donor kidney transplantation, such as cross-match and blood group incompatible transplants through desensitization and kidney paired exchange. Uh, Dr. Leventhal's basic science and translational research activities currently focus upon the use of cell-based therapies to achieve transplantation tolerance. Um, he has co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications Dr. Leventhal is a member of many national and international professional transplantation and surgical societies. Um, <clears throat> and then we have Dr. Anuja Java. Uh, sorry. Dr. Anuja Java is a transplant nephrologist at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis and the director of kidney transplant at the John Cochran VA Medical Center. Uh, her research focuses on complement-mediated kidney disease. She co-chairs the NIH-funded clinical genome resource, ClinGen, uh, the Complement Gene Curation Expert Panel. Uh, her clinical interests include taking care of patients after kidney transplant, with a particular emphasis on those at risk for current glomerular disease and conducting living donor evaluations. Uh, Dr. Java has served on the ASN Career Advancement Committee. She's an elected counselor in women in nephrology. Is also recipient of the National Kidney Foundation Award of Excellence for significant contributions to the field of kidney disease and the renal community. Um, and last but not least, we have Gisela, Gisela Delgado. Um, I'd like to introduce as well. Um, <clears throat> she's a lived patient experience. She's a preemptive living donor kidney transplant recipient. She's part of the IGA Nephropathy Foundation, the Talaris. Patient Advisory Council and the IG Nephropathy Foundation Brand Director. Thank you all for joining and thank you all for your discussion. Um, we welcome a lively and uh, informative discussion as always. So with that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Leventhal. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Udani, and um, great to see everyone today. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, a discussion after my presentation and the presentations today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see um, my screen. Um, if not, please let me know before I jump off here. So um, this morning we'll be talking about um, uh, tolerance uh, as a means to eliminate the need for drug-based immunosuppression, um, something I've been involved with uh, from a research perspective, both uh, translationally and clinically for uh, um, more than 20 years. Um, you've had my introductions, and uh, here are my disclosures. I currently receive grant support from Talaris Therapeutics, and I'll be talking today about an investigational uh, uh, therapy, the so-called FCR001, that's being developed by Talaris uh, to induce tolerance uh, in living donor kidney transplant recipients. So today's objectives are to uh, better understand um, the uh, treatment burden associated with the uh, use of immunosuppressive drugs long-term in our transplant patient population to introduce you to uh, FCR001, the so-called facilitating cell-based uh, approach for engineering donor stem cells to induce 
tolerance to a combined kidney and stem cell transplant and to reviewing outcomes of uh, a phase two trial that we here at Northwestern were uh, very closely involved with, um, with the large majority of those patients being uh, treated here at Northwestern starting back in 2009, and to uh, introduce you to the ongoing um, Freedom One and Freedom Two studies. Um, furthermore, to um, um, then um, have um, a patient-centered discussion here um, uh, that um, where I'll turn things over um, to our uh, other speakers for this morning. So uh, turning then to um, kidney transplantation, and the, um, I think we all know uh, that um, immunosuppressive drugs are uh, have really revolutionized um, outcomes for patients with kidney transplant, um, tremendous advances in the use of immunosuppressive drugs. Um, and, and you can see here on the slide, survival probabilities for trans, different types of transplants versus dialysis. And I think it's now very well accepted for nearly all patients with end-stage renal disease who are appropriate surgical candidates and medical candidates uh, that the best form of renal replacement therapy in terms of improving patient survival uh, is a transplant uh, with um, a, a distinct advantage to receiving a living donor transplant and living donor kidney transplants, although a, a minority of the transplants we do every year in the United States uh, really provide the best uh, long-term outcomes, although those outcomes are by no means in the long-term uh, ideal, as we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and living donor kidneys had the longest half-life as compared to deceased donor transplants and certainly uh, dialysis. Uh, but as you can see, out to 10 years, that, that's still a significant number of grafts being lost. Um, and a lot of these grafts being lost also happen to do uh, to, to patients uh, being lost. And a lot of this is due to the side effects uh, of, of immunosuppressive drugs. Um, this is another way of looking at data. Um, looking at living donor kidney transplant survival, asking the question, how are we doing over time? Are we getting better? And, and clearly we are. There's been incremental improvement in survival, but there's, we're still seeing around a third of our uh, living donor kidney transplant recipients requiring the need for a second transplant um, within a decade. And for many of our patients who are young, um, in their 20s and their 30s, their 40s, um, this means that they're looking at, you know, at least a second, perhaps a third transplant with a diminishing returns with those additional transplants over, over, over time. And so there's this idea of one transplant for life that really has captured our imagination uh, in the field uh, for more than half a century that, um, you know, through some of the approaches we'll talk about today, and, and, and in particular, the, the FCR-based approach, we're beginning to maybe see the door open and this uh, opportunity to uh, avoid the need for drug-based immunosuppression, which really contributes significantly to um, the, the inability to have the best long-term outcomes uh, for our patients. And importantly, rejection accounts for 17% of graft loss in, in the first year and a, a much larger percentage of, the, of graft losses after the first year. So if, despite the, the use of these drugs having great you know, outcomes in the first year, we're seeing longer term outcomes. And a lot of this has to do with, with, with compliance and side effects of the immunosuppression. Now, you know, this is just referring to the KDGO guidelines. We know that you know, the mainstay of maintenance immunosuppression in the United States, and for some time now, has been the use of calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, over 90% of patients continue to be maintained on CNI based uh, immunosuppressive regimens. I think it's interesting that there have been failures uh, to develop. CNI uh, uh, free regimens that can be durably applied to the large majority of, uh, of patients. Um, and, and this, I think, is, contributes to the continued high level use of CNIs. But these drugs have significant side effects. Long term CNIs nephrotoxicity is, is a significant cause of histologic injury in allografts. And here are some of the findings that one sees on histopathology. You see nearly 100% of, of, of patients who've had a kidney transplant by a decade uh, have, have, have evidence of this. Uh, and so um, it, it's quite significant. And this you know, contributes significantly to um, allograft loss and, and damage to native kidneys. We, we see many patients who've been longstanding liver, heart, lung transplant recipients who end up coming to us needing a kidney transplant because 
they've developed end stage renal disease or are now on dialysis and need a kidney after uh, an, a, a, a non renal a transplant. So the impact of these drugs as a necessary evil, a means to an end, um, are, are, are quite significant. Uh, and there are other associated risks with, with immune, chronic immunosuppression, which I think many of the providers on this call and patients are quite familiar with. Uh, infections, which can lead to many complications post-transplant, are quite prevalent. Um, we also know and relevant in this day and age where we continue to struggle with the pandemic and new pathogens which are emerging, that vaccination may not be as effective in chronically immunosuppressed patients. Um, and malignancies, immunosuppression significantly increases the risk of malignancy, which is a common uh, a cause of, of death uh, post-transplant. Um, and um, we, we know that these include not just you know, skin cancers, but other quite significant malignancies. And you can see the risk of malignancies here uh, as one uh, proceeds out from transplant. And again, so th this is, you know, we're sort of uh, robbing from Peter to pay Paul here used with the use of immunosuppression. Um, and there are long-term uh, downsides to the use of these drugs. And these also include um, uh, metabolic derangements, um, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which increase the risk of cardiovascular death uh, in our patients. And then uh, the well-described neurotoxic side effects of calcineurin inhibitors. A lot of these side effects, which limit quality of life in our patients, contribute to noncompliance, which is really, at, I think, the heart of the um, uh, late acute rejection we see in patients, which, um, as many of us know, is, is, is often diagnosed late and very difficult to reverse and can contribute to accelerated allograft loss. Um, also contributing to poor quality of life is the pill burden that's associated uh, with uh, the use of chronic immunosuppression. And you can see it's quite um, uh, um, challenging for patients in uh, complex medical regimens, which are very, very difficult in patients uh, with limited health literacy, patients who get older, who have cognitive dysfunction. Um, and uh, we know that, it's, that it can be very complicated with the immunosuppressive drugs interacting with many of um, our uh, other medications and pharmacogenomics uh, being important in patients uh, due to the way they, they metabolize, in particular, CNIs such as, um, as, as, as tacrolimus. Uh, and you can see um, on the right-hand side of the slide, sort of the other um, uh, drugs that our kidney transplant recipients need uh, over time. And, and this pill burden uh, is quite significant. There's an economic cost associated with this for patients. Uh, there's also a significant quality of life impact uh, on our patients. Uh, with patients um, either subconsciously or deliberately becoming non-compliant with drugs because of the complexity of these regimens. And we know that this non-inherence can lead significantly to rejection or graft loss. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I simply put, you know, I think for, for many of us, we know that, you know, the, the, the drugs we use are a means to an end with excellent short-term results with still challenges in the long term. Yes, there have been improvements over time, but we, we, we certainly can be doing better uh, than uh, more than a third of our patients losing their grafts at, 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 at 10 years. Uh, and that's just in living donor transplants. Um, it, it, it's, um, the outcomes are, are worse, as we know, in the larger number of deceased donor transplants. And so there's been an interest, a continuing interest in developing um, successful approaches to inducing immune tolerance. And we'll talk specifically today about the facilitating cell-based approach of the FCR001. So what is immune tolerance? So uh, and this is sort of hearkening back to the seminal work of, of, of Medawar and his colleagues in the 1950s. Uh, it's a state where the recipient's immune system will specifically accept donor organs, tissues, and cells, but will respond normally to foreign antigens and, and, and pathogens. And so um, establishment of post-transplant immune tolerance may allow transplant recipients to discontinue chronic immunosuppression and hopefully derive the benefits of being off of immunosuppression by avoiding many of the side effects uh, that we uh, just reviewed in the earlier slides. Now, um, one of the, the approach that Medawar championed uh, in mice and that we've struggled for, the, for more than 
you know, 70 years to try and, 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 and translate from the bench to the bedside was one where um, one tried to achieve something known as chimerism, these persistent engraftment of donor stem cells. And there have been hurdles to inducing immune tolerance through you know, allogeneic uh, combined uh, solid organ and stem cell transplant. The primary uh, challenge being that of donor recipient HLA mismatch, where, and that degree of mismatch, which is the rule in solid organ transplant, can increase the risk of, 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 of failing to engraft, or in the situation where engraftment does take place, of that donor immune system reacting against the recipient and causing graft versus host disease. And we also need a regimen, conditioning, which is needed to create space, if you will, in the bone marrow for those donor stem cells to successfully take. That, 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 that conditioning uh, has to be compatible with end-stage organ disease, renal failure in the case of a kidney transplant. And so we need something where the toxicity and long-term complications associated with the conditioning uh, is acceptable, that the end justifies the means ultimately for, for the patient. And so the FC001 is an investigational cell therapy that um, is based upon the seminal work of Suzanne Ilstad, uh, who identified a particular cell population that we'll talk about uh, here in a second in the bone marrow uh, that is capable of helping to promote the induction of, of stem cell engraftment establishment of chimerism with um, uh, a, a much reduced risk of developing graft versus host disease. And so what we see here is that donor uh, stem cell um, uh, graft um, being engineered to create the FCR001. It's introduced into the recipient and you then have coexistence of the donor and recipient immune systems, so-called chimerism. And we know that chimerism is an indicator of successful stem cell engraftment and may predict whether a transplant recipient can discontinue immunosuppression. And we'll show you some of the data from our phase two trial here in a second. Now, uh, the FC001, um, there's a proprietary engineering process and there's a composition in the donor stem cell graft where we're targeting uh, a certain number of so-called progenitor cells, CD34 cells, the so-called facilitating cell population, which Dr. Illustad identified uh, almost uh, more than 40 years ago, and then an allowable number of alpha beta T cells in the graft that help promote stem cell engraftment for, from the donor side. And this has been the basis, this uh, engineering process, for the uh, work that we conducted in the phase two trial and is currently being, uh, is the basis for the ongoing freedom one and freedom two studies, which we'll talk about. Now, there's been a, a large uh, amount of preclinical work that's been uh, conducted uh, out of uh, uh, ILSTAD's group and others showing that the FCs, which are distinct from stem cells and have a, a certain uh, phenotypic characteristic or characteristics, that they have certain functions as shown here on the slide. And um, uh, the references are here for your consideration. But importantly, these animal models demonstrate that the FC-based therapies have the potential to induce immune tolerance. And, and, and what we've been able to do is to uh, develop uh, clinically applicable strategies to enrich for the FCs uh, in a human stem cell graft. And that was the basis for the work that we've done uh, go going back uh, to the phase two trial that was initiated in, in, in 2009. <clears throat> so let's talk about that phase two trial which I have had uh, the uh, distinct pleasure of, of, of working uh, with and being involved with since its inception. Um, it was a total of 37 donor recipient pairs, all living donor of recipient pairs. Um, 36 of these 37 patients were transplanted at Northwestern. And you can see on this cartoon slide, uh, sort of the uh, overall study design. Um, uh, the donor underwent a peripheral mobilization using drugs such as GCSF to mobilize stem cells and FCs from the bone marrow. Uh, that uh, mobilized apheresis product was then uh, engineered to create the FC. The recipient also underwent a mobilized uh, apheresis collection that was not uh, manipulated to serve as a rescue collection in case of bone marrow uh, failure or bone marrow dysfunction in the post-transplant period. Low intensity or non-myoablative conditioning was used, uh, modeled after the seminal work of Fuchs and Lusnick at Johns Hopkins using pre and post transplant cyclophosphamide, an approach that has revolutionized uh, uh, allogeneic stem cell transplantation. 
And this uh, conditioning uh, served as the induction therapy, if you will, for the living donor kidney transplant. We typically did the kidney transplant on a Thursday, and then the day following that, the engineered cryopreserved FCR uh, was uh, thawed out and infused into the patient. Now, the primary endpoint was the establishment of chimerism, durable chimerism that uh, we predicted would lead to tolerance. And then uh, the, uh, with follow-up and immunosuppressive withdrawal, complete immunosuppression withdrawal targeted at 12 months post-transplant. And we've had long-term follow-up of these phase two trial subjects uh, going out uh, more than 10 years. Um, these donor recipient pairs, you can see the eligibility criteria. We were agnostic to the, to the degree of HLA mismatch. So unlike some other approaches, such as the, uh, the work that's being done at MGH or Stanford, where a certain minimal degree uh, of HLA match or complete match, in the case of the Stanford uh, group, uh, was required for uh, some of their uh, in, uh, for enrollment. Uh, we were uh, agnostic to the degree of HLA match because we knew that that was the large majority of patients that we'd be having to deal with uh, to be and wanted something which would be broadly clinically applicable. And so you can see that uh, as of uh, this past spring, um, you can see that the large majority of these patients all have more than three years worth of follow-up, and we have a number of individuals who are, uh, are out actually uh, more than a decade. And so um, the majority of these patients in the phase two trial were able to discontinue immunosuppression. Uh, you can see the 37 subjects here, 27 of them developed durable chimerism, and 26 of those 27 patients were able to come entirely off of immunosuppression. One of those subjects, unfortunately, developed treatment-resistant graft-versus-host disease, as shown on this slide, which was diagnosed late due to poor uh, follow-up and communication with the subject, uh, which uh, re was related to subject mortality within a year. But as of uh, this past spring, 70% of patients developed stable chimerism and were able to be weaned off of immunosuppression uh, with no biopsy proven, ac proven acute rejection and normal renal histology uh, an excellent uh, estimated GFR uh, going out um, uh, for, for years uh, post a transplant. Um, eight subjects um, had transient chimerism, and there were rejections in that uh, group of patients who had transient chimerism. Uh, a majority of those subjects were able to be weaned to some lower degree of immunosuppression, and you can see there were also some graft losses and one death uh, in that group. Uh, most of those transiently chimeric subjects uh, lost donor chimerism within the first uh, six months of transplant, and there were some associated features of those oh, patients man. shown uh, on the slide. Uh, you can see the patient disposition, two patients who um, also failed uh, to engraft uh, in this cohort. And uh, some of the associated findings, one was highly sensitized and one had an underlying bone marrow uh, disorder. Um, Here's some follow-up on years. You can see we have uh, almost half a dozen patients who've been off of immunosuppression more than a decade. This is a slide from earlier this year, and we continue to see patients march out with stable engraftment. Um, and again, as the chimerism goes, so goes for tolerance. And um, to chimerism, uh, as early as three months post-transplant, if greater than 50% whole blood or T-cell chimerism was an excellent predictor of engraftment of, 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 and stability of the tolerance. And you can see that um, we were able to get patients off of immunosuppression, which a high degree of HLA mismatch uh, with a, a large number of patients, as shown on this slide, off of immunosuppression who are unrelated donor recipient pairs with a very poor degree of HLA match. And again, as I mentioned, uh, individuals with greater than 50% chimerism at three months and at six months was very predictive of, of durable immune tolerance over time. And you can see here at 90% and 96% predictive of, of, of coming off of immunosuppression. And, those, and again, none of these patients who've come off of immunosuppression have needed to go back onto immunosuppression. Now, an important question here is, does the end justify the means? Uh, do we find that the patients are deriving a benefit from being off of immunosuppression? And, and the short answer is yes. And this is uh, a, a, a internal study that we conducted at Northwestern comparing our subjects who came off of immunosuppression in orange to um, 
a, a cohort of patients who received a living uh, donor kidney transplant at Northwestern during the same time interval. Uh, this was uh, a, a crude retrospective analysis of patients who would have been el eligible for the, for the uh, phase two trial um, and uh, were maintained on standard of care immunosuppression. And you can see in the black line that those patients um, had inferior estimated GFR. And the, and, the, and the curves continue to widen with, 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 with uh, continued follow-up. So better renal function in patients off of immunosuppression compared to standard of care patients. We also looked at the need for medication to manage hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And the patients who are off of immunosuppression who are tolerant have much better uh, cardiovascular profiles with only 18% of the tolerant patients requiring medication for hypertension and only 9% for hyperlipidemia as compared to the much higher per, uh, percentages of patients who receive who a standard of care transplant on maintenance immunosuppression. Uh, I, I know that we're, we, we have uh, some people on the call today who have a personal uh, uh, interest uh, or professional interest in, in, in recurrent renal diseases. And remarkably, although the numbers are small, um, durable chimerism and the tolerance therein achieved seems to protect you from disease recurrence. Uh, none of our patients who were tolerant who had IgA or FSGS or membranous nephropathy um, ended up uh, with, with disease recurrence. Very importantly, uh, we want to make sure that patients who um, are in this trial and uh, come off of immunosuppression um, are, uh, in fact, uh, deriving, uh, you know, are, are, are immunologically uh, intact. And so this is a data we published a number of years ago, uh, looking at uh, leukocyte diversity and T-cell subpopulation diversity in the patients who've come off of immunosuppression. And, and what we found, which is very consistent with the allogeneic stem cell transplant literature, is that these patients repopulate over the course of one to two years. I will also mention that we've been, we looked at vaccination responses in our patients and have found them to robustly respond to vaccination. We recently presented at the most uh, uh, recent American Transplant Congress data uh, regarding COVID-19 showing that these patients off of immunosuppression do not have the same terrible disease course that many of our immunosuppressed transplant patients can have and can respond to vaccination with any of the vaccines out there successfully, and uh, that either infection with SARS-CoV-2 or vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 does not translate into loss of chimerism or breaking of tolerance. A very important and, and I think comforting uh, data regarding the immunologic competence uh, of the patients. Let me see if I can continue to move down here. Now, in terms of the recipient safety profile, again, we did not see acute rejection of donor DSA in the patients off of immunosuppression, uh, no serious infusion-related reactions. Most of the AEs, which were infectious AEs, occurred in individuals in the first 12 months post-transplant while patients happened to be on conventional immunosuppression that was being weaned. Again, I mentioned there were biopsy-proven acute rejections in this trial, but they were only in the patients who did not achieve durable chimerism. There were three graft losses in patients uh, in this trial, and, and you can see the time uh, occurs for graft loss that took place in these individuals with transient chimerism. There were two cases of graft versus host disease in the trial for an overall incidence of 5.5%. One of these was promptly diagnosed that was steroid responsive. Um, and that patient was successfully weaned off of immunosuppression, although he does have some mild symptoms of chronic GVH. And then there was a second patient who was late to diagnosis and had treatment resistant GVH, who unfortunately succumbed to related complications within a year post-transplant. Now, uh, there were three deaths that occurred in durably chimeric patients over the uh, long-term follow-up in this trial. I mentioned the one subject with GVH. There was a subject who four and a half years post-transplant who was a heavy smoker, developed lung cancer, but he chose not to be treated for. And then there was an individual who did not comply with his recommended revaccination schedule after combined kidney and stem cell transplant who, can, who traveled to abroad and contracted pneumococcal sepsis um, and um, succumbed to that pneumococcal infection. 
There was one death occurring in the transiently chimeric patient um, uh, at four and a half years related to um, infections while that individual uh, was on immunosuppression. Um, in terms of the donors, uh, the AEs that we saw in the donors related to stem cell collection um, and, and mobilization uh, were quite uh, mild. So that brings us then to the Freedom One trial. Uh, this is a phase three trial that's going to uh, rigorously test the uh, phase two study, again, uh, based upon the results of the phase two. Uh, this was submitted to the FDA, and this is now being advanced by Tolaris uh, Therapeutics. Um, the primary endpoint is looking at patients who can be weaned from immunosuppression without rejection at 24 months post-transplant. And you can see the other key secondary endpoints related to re uh, renal function. It's an ambitious trial of 120 patients with a two-to-one randomization scheme of 80 subjects in the treatment arm receiving the FCR and uh, 40 control patients. And this slide looks similar. Uh, it, it, it's because we model the uh, collection and the infusion um, to be that uh, identical to what was used in the phase two in terms of the type of conditioning, um, uh, the so-called pre and post uh, psi, uh, and then uh, FCR infusion. And you can see the long-term follow-up and, and the endpoints uh, on this cartoon slide. Again, tacrolimus and mycophenolate-based immunosuppression to be weaned uh, if there's no rejection and durable chimerism over, over the course uh, of post-transplant in the treatment arm. The inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria are shown here. Uh, patients who are highly sensitized with a PRA of greater than 80% are excluded. Um, we noted in the phase two trial that the two cases of graft versus host disease that occurred were in female, unrelated, poorly matched donor recipient to recipient combinations. So that now is an exclusion criteria. Um, patients have to be vaccinated against uh, COVID-19 to be eligible for this trial and uh, negative uh, test negative to, uh, against COVID-19 uh, to be enrolled into the study. Now, uh, there's another freedom study, uh, an FCR-based assessment, which is also being conducted, which is a phase two trial, which is asking whether or not we can induce tolerance remote from the time of the kidney transplant. And we view this as important because this is a sort of setting the foundation for us to be able to apply this tolerance induction approach using the FCR to in the deceased donor setting. So the so-called Freedom 2 study is one that is actually separating out the transplant event from the tolerance induction through the stem cell transplant, which will take place months after the kidney transplant. And so it's an open label study, no randomization to assess the safety and efficacy of the FCR-based approach in three to 12 months after living donor kidney transplant. Again, uh, the primary and secondary endpoints is shown here portion of patients getting off of immunosuppression without rejection by two years. Um, so individual, there will be a total of 15 pairs. Uh, patients will be eligible at three to 12 months after their kidney transplant if they have a biopsy at three months, showing that no evidence of rejection, no evidence of sensitization, and otherwise meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, the donors would then undergo a mobilization and apheresis, as shown here on this slide. And uh, recipients as well for a rescue collection, and then the um, conditioning, the low intensity conditioning that was used in the phase two and is being used in freedom one, uh, and all levels of HLA mismatching between donor and recipients are being allowed uh, in freedom two as well. And here you can see the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study. Again, I think very importantly, there's a time window here between three months and 12 months um, a caveat here is that in the induction immunosuppression used at the time of transplant in the kidney patient is important in that individuals who receive alemtuzumab for lymphocyte depleting induction uh, would be excluded uh, from uh, consideration. So to summarize, uh, I, I think um, hopefully uh, it, we now all appreciate that chronic immunosuppression can impose significant health and quality of life burdens uh, on patients. Um, the FCR, which I've talked with you about today, is currently under investigation and shows promise for the establishment of durable chimerism 
and living donor kidney transplant recipients, uh, allowing for the uh, complete discontinuation of immunosuppression without uh, rejection, development of DSA, and, and, and intriguingly, disease recurrence in, pa in patients at risk. Uh, and we're about the Freedom 1 and Freedom 2 studies are currently underway uh, to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the FCR-based approach uh, versus uh, standard of care recipients, uh, and also looking uh, importantly at the safety of this uh, uh, collecting cells for the graft engineering from living uh, kidney donors. Uh, if you're interested in learning more uh, about uh, the sites which are open and enrolling patients in these trials, uh, I show uh, this slide here for you to take a snapshot of and make a note of the information uh, to go online. Uh, and I look forward to answering uh, questions and lively discussion um, as we uh, move through the rest of uh, today's uh, conference. Um, um, and so with that, I, I like to turn uh, the... Uh, the podium over to uh, uh, the next speaker who will uh, talk about embracing the voice of the patient. Um, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Leventhal. I don't think this is where we really love to hear from the voice of the patient, Giselle Delgado. Um, are you available to uh, take over? Yes, this is my favorite way to spend a Sunday. So thank you. For having me, <laughs> um, and uh, shall I uh, shall I pause my uh, sharing? Yeah, I don't I don't have any slides to share. Um, it's I'm just just me speaking for the next ten minutes or so. Okay. I think we're good here. Um, a couple of things I just want to preface is that uh, I. I'm not involved in any uh, clinical trials currently, but um, knowing everything that I know today, I, I wish I was. Um, and I know that that comes up a lot, but um, I'll start of, just start with sharing my story of being diagnosed to, to where I am today. Um, I, at, it was 1994, I was a freshman in high school. I uh, went to use the restroom and I had some Coca-Cola urine. Um, at the time, it just looked, you know, I was just like, my urine is dark. I, I called out to my mom. We went um, to the emergency room. Um, I said, there's probably some sort of bleeding or something going on inside. Um, thus begin uh, what I call sort of like project. Uh, let's try to figure out what this is. Um, and from the time of the dark colored urine to actually being um, ultimately diagnosed via renal biopsy, um, that was about six months. It's pretty vivid in my mind as a teenager because I remember it was around the holiday season um, that I, I became sick. I was recovering from an upper respiratory infection. Um, I was tested for many things. Uh, for a long time, they thought I had some sort of uh, mono or some sort of viral infection. Um, thus began you know, many labs, getting retested, trying to figure out what was going on. Ultimately, the biopsy that I had in, the, in May um, confirmed that I had uh, some crescent, you know, scarring formed on my kidneys. And I was diagnosed with, at the time, um, they just referred to it as Berger's disease. Um, not much more was, was uh, information was really available. This is before Google and such so as a patient, as a young patient, um, you know, was basically just taking whatever my nephrologist was telling me, my parents at the time. So, Ultimately, what they said is uh, you have this kidney disease. What it is is a very slow progressing chronic kidney disease that will likely ultimately cause kidney failure um, in about 20 to 25 years. Um, there's no real way to treat this disease, um, but what we'll look out for are symptoms over the years. At the time, since I was 14, um, I was seen by a pediatric nephrologist um, throughout the duration of high school, then throughout the duration of, of college, my trips to a specialized nephrologist became far and fewer in, in between because that was the only real flare up that I had. And I didn't really have any um, other significant symptoms that could be treated at the time. I didn't have high blood pressure and I wasn't um, showing signs of it, you know, extreme proteinuria. Go along my, my life. Um, I stopped seeing a, a specialist nephrologist when I graduated out. Um, I never made that transition from pediatric to adult. Um, and always figured that if there was something going on with my kidneys, that um, I would know about it. And as I continued to see a regular uh, 
medical doctor, uh, you know, going to uh, gynecologist, internist, uh, getting my annual physical, always mentioning that when I was 14, I was diagnosed with this kidney disease. Um, you know, I, I was done via biopsy. I'm not under any treatment. No one ever called out to me that I should probably still be seeing a nephrologist, a nephrologist regularly to be getting checked in. And what ended up happening was in uh, the like winter of 2011, I ended up in the emergency room. Um, I had just recovered from flu at home. And about a week later, all the symptoms returned. Um, I couldn't keep anything down. I go into the ER, my blood pressure is, is pretty high. They ask about my medical history. Again, I'm in my, you know, I'm in my 20s and I'm like, yeah, I was diagnosed with a kidney disease when I was a teenager. I'm not being seen by any doctor. I haven't had any issues. And from that hospital visit in February, they're like, you need to go see a kidney specialist. There's definitely something going on with your kidneys. So I look up, um, go and get into a, a kidney specialist uh, hospital. And even upon my first visit with that doctor, he took a look at me and he's like, why are you here? And I said, well, explain to him the whole situation about what had happened. And he's like, you probably, you know, were dehydrated or something. That was his initial reaction. He's like, you look perfectly fine, which is something I've been told many times uh, in my life. And he was like, do you have any history of kidney disease? And I said, yes, I was diagnosed when I was 14. And he said, how do you know? And I said, they did a biopsy. And he said, okay, well, let's see what's going on now. The next day, the doctor was calling me, telling me that I needed to return to his office immediately, that um, I was experiencing some uh, kidney function decline and that I needed to be put on some sort of treatment at ASAP. Luckily, um, I was able to get, um, you know, start my quote unquote treatment. And then one of the other things my doctor immediately wanted to do was to confirm my diagnosis of IJ nephropathy. And um, he asked if he could do a repeat uh, kidney biopsy at that time, to which I agreed. And um, I was nervous because I did suffer um, internal bleeding with my first kidney biopsy. And I did suffer internal bleeding again after um, this reconfirmation of biopsy. Um, luckily, the way data is collected, my doctor was able to pull the records from my original diagnosis and look at what was happening here. And it looks like at some point I must've had another flare up, but again, the IgA was not active. Um, so then becomes the, well, what happens next? And uh, I'm a, I work in creative and marketing as a, as a profession. I, I would say, if you had to dumb down my position, I would say just consider the role of project manager. And what really strikes me during my diagnosis is that in, in the realm of being diagnosed with IgA nephropathy, and knowing ultimately that I'll need kidney, you know, I'm gonna reach kidney failure and, and need dialysis or, or transplant, is that I was constantly just waiting for that to happen. There was never a doctor visit where I was hopeful that I was going to be doing better. It was just maybe uh, that I was slowing down things. So from 2011 uh, to 2017, um, those six years, I was just constantly um, checking out my nephrologist, um, getting regular labs done. Um, I was on steroid therapy for about six months uh, to try to help. I tried different um, ACE and ARB inhibitors. Um, they did help with some of my protein loss, um, but the sickest I ever felt in my whole diagnosis with IJ nephropathy, I would say those six months when I was on steroid therapy, and then uh, fast forward to you know 2019, the 30, the about a month or so before transplant is really when I felt the the sickest. Um, now from 2011 to 2017, I was just on a bunch of different cocktails and trying to slow down this disease. My doctor was very honest with me, which I appreciate, and he said the goal is always going to be for you to try to get a preemptive transplant. And that became my focus as a project manager is how do I avoid dialysis to get a preemptive transplant? Because as we see with the data, that is going to be my best chance at a better quality of life overall. As time progressed, um, in 2017, I qualified um, on the list for UNOS 
and I didn't realize how hard it was to find a living donor. Um, it's not like they show in the movies. It doesn't matter how loved you are, how many people know you. Um, it, there's still a lot of fear around the subject and there's not a lot of education. Um, and it's also some, not something that necessarily the transplant center helps you with. It's not like when you need um, a stem cell trans, transplant and you have programs like Be The Match. So that was, that was pretty tough. Um, I was fortunate enough um, to meet someone who taught me how to really advocate for myself. And once I got on the, the precipice of, I, I was really um, in need of dialysis probably. My, my GFR um, had dropped to about an eight um, and my creatinine was somewhere pretty close to six, 5.89. 5 um, I created a kidney campaign and uh, I went viral on social media. And I think because no one really knew how sick I was because I was still working um, this whole time, my quality of life had diminished greatly. I mean, for sure I wasn't hanging out. There were very limited things that I can eat, but I was, um, I was able to create this campaign. And luckily I, I do come from a creative marketing background and I was able to start finding some, some donors and um, it'll be a great lifetime movie one day, but my brother ended up being my living donor. Um, and from the time that he was tested and uh, passed to when um, I was in surgery, that was a period of about two weeks. So in, in uh, late February of 2019, I received my, my kidney transplant. And uh, my brother and I were estranged at the time. So that's why it's kind of, um, I really emphasize the importance of being vulnerable if you have patients who are looking for kidneys, um, just tell them to really put their story out there because um, I was still trying to manage a very uncontrollable uh, situation. Um, Post-transplant, um, I'm talking really fast because I'm from New York and I can do that, but also I wanna leave time for questions because I, I do believe that um, the, these are good conversations to have, but post-transplant, when did I start to feel better um, immediately? I mean, waking up on that hospital uh, table, I, there was a certain surge of energy immediately in my body, probably all of the steroids that they're giving me and all the medications, but um, you know, being diagnosed at 14 and getting a transplant at 38, um, there's kind of like, I don't know what it was like to be, what, it, what this new normal was. So for me, I was pretty taken back by it. Um, and then becomes the, the post-transplant treatment of being on immunosuppression, which I understood um, through being educated at the transplant center that I was always going to be on this medication um, for the rest of my life. And you know how critical it was for me to take my medication on time. Um, I really wasn't aware of all the side effects. Um, and I call them scares with being on immunosuppression. And I'm extremely grateful that I was able to be uh, transplanted prior to this pandemic, but it, it, uh, it never, you don't just get a transplant and you're okay. And uh, being immunosuppressed, I, um, you know, I've had a couple of side effects. I've had a BK virus up here, luckily was able to avoid it. Um, I just, recovered from um, this past spring, I, I, uh, I got shingles, which is, um, I didn't even know that that was a thing that could happen at 41, but apparently it is. And, you know, the response, even in the hospital, when they realized, um, when they asked me what kind of medications I was taking, they're like, oh, you're on, oh yeah, that does happen. It wasn't something that was at the top of my radar, um, which is pretty scary. Um, my tolerance with the uh, one of my immunosuppressant medications um, is not great. Um, I have some gut issues, which it's it's a little tough to kind of like still want to go do all the things that I want to do. And that pill burden that, uh, that we talked about of having to make sure no matter where I am, um, not only do I have the medication I need, but for the day or the week, I'm always, wherever I go, I'm always keeping like extra medication with me. Um, which makes me feel empowered, but then I always worry about losing that because one of the things is the medication you're on, you can't just go to your local CVS or, or Walgreens and pick it up. It's all specialty order. Um, 
and you know that understanding that I have this thing I need to take care of. I can't just go and get a new kidney, um, even though there's been a lot of developments and, and what have you. But the fear of a couple of things post transplant. Um, one is, is is losing my kidney um, due to something that I'm not doing right. Which the one thing that I can do is try to eat healthy, exercise, take care of myself, take my medication on time. But some of the other things that I can't control is the toxic toxicity that's um, associated with these medications that even though I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, um, I can still have some sort of loss of, of, uh, of this kidney. Also the potential for IgA nephropathy to return, um, which is pretty scary. And um, it's kind of frustrating just trying to kind of get comfortable with whatever happens, happens. Um, I also do have uh, some donor specific antibodies that have appeared and my numbers, my, my labs look great, but then there's something going on with these antibodies. So it's unnerving and it's something I know I'm gonna have to deal with um, forever, but I am hopeful. And I know that there's been a lot of development in, in science and um, I wish that if I could go back in time, something like uh, you know, this new drug was, was available just because I, I believe that we're sort of in this golden age of, of, of kidney disease and uh, real development actually being, uh, real treatment being put out there. Um, but it is frustrating. And, and again, like not being able to see someone that looks sick, I think it's really hard as a patient, even sometimes in front of your, your medical team, you may look better than you're actually feeling. And um, I don't, I don't think, until I got to transplant, I don't think my nephrologists were really checking in on me in that way. Um, I'm trying to see if I missed anything. Um, Kevin or Sarah from, I'm looking over this list. I wanna be cognizant of time. Um, any, anything else you want me to touch on or I should call out? Hey Giselle, this is Kevin. Um, Hi. No, I think it's just whatever, I think whatever, um, you know, whatever I think I would just say maybe is that maybe what people don't understand about the post-transplant post experience. Um, um, I just think that I'll just speak for myself, but one of the frustrations is, is that um, I sometimes don't feel like the transplant patient, patients feel heard. And we sometimes learn to condition ourselves just to grin and bear it as opposed to, as opposed to maybe sharing that. Anyway, that's just my experience, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, there is, you know, I think, I think there's something that happens when you actually go through the transplant process uh, with, with some people. I, I see that some people that just let the fear consume them, but I, I feel like I'm a little more um, brazen than previous. And I know my, I'm more in tune with my body now than I've ever been. And um, one of the things that I talk about um, when, I'm, when I'm working with other patients is, you know, with your, um, when your doctor tells you, when, when you suggest medication and a patient says, why, like really try to explain to them why they need to be on this, um, but in layman's terms, um, it can be very overwhelming. So one of the things that, and I, and I mentioned this before, and, uh, when I was on the, the sickest I ever felt in my entire almost 30 years of kidney disease was the six months I was on steroid therapy and then like the 30 days before I had a transplant. And post-transplant, my clinic um, is actually a steroid-free facility. And um, I was like, yay, amazing. Thank you so much. That's, I, I feel good about that because I've heard a lot that you know all of a sudden you get put on prednisone and it's not like, hey, take it for a couple of months. You're just on this low dosage of, of steroids for the rest of your life. And that was another thing I was afraid of. And um, I think it was about a month post-transplant. I, I was in clinic and my nephrologist mentioned, um, okay, well, we, I wanna talk to you about prednisone. And I was like, why? And he was like, well, in a study with some patients because of the IgA, it may or may not help. And I was like, okay, 
but like, is there a way we can tell if it will help before you start to put it on me for the rest of my life? Like I'm, I'm 38 years old. Um, I, I know that once I start it, I won't be able to get off of it. And he's like, well, everything looks okay now. He goes, you mean, would you be open to doing a kidney biopsy again? And again, um, I was kind of scared because the kidney biopsies I've had before were not great experiences, but those were uh, pre-transplant. Post-transplant, much easier procedure. I would, if you told me I had to get one of those once a week to, to keep me off of steroids, I would do it. Um, and I know that seems very evasive, but if the only way to know what's going on with the kidney is to look at it, I'll sign up for it. Um, you know, the suffering internal bleeding, getting, having, needing a blood transfusion, not being able to control your body is, is terrible. And I was very grateful for um, my doctor sort of like listen to me and he was like, okay, let's, let's see who wins this sort of, and it's been a joke. I'm now um, a little over three years post-transplant. I've had three uh, kidney biopsies. Um, so far, I'm very grateful. There's uh, no recurrence of IgA seeming to be forming. Um, and I was able to avoid doing another, now we're gonna go to every other year. Um, if I need to go on the prednisone, I will, but I don't wanna be put on it just because it may or may not help because I have severe PTSD from what those six months. And I feel like now I'm like getting back my life and I don't, I don't wanna be that person that I was when I was on steroids. So I do think it's about um, talking to your patients about how the drugs <laughs> actually make them feel, not just symptoms. And um, when I first met Kevin, it was you know, at an event where the IJ Nephropathy Foundation and the National Kidney Foundation spoke in front of the FDA. And from that meeting, the biggest thing I, I got was that all of my feelings were valid. There was the, the brain fog, the, you know, the, the, the extreme fatigue, the back pain, things that weren't necessarily associated with your disease, depending on where you were, but they actually were pretty valid. Um, because unless it's an extreme coincidence that these 200 people were all feeling these certain things at a certain time. So um, I can't emphasize that I'm like, like, try to sit with your patients and just make sure they understand the importance of why they're, they're doing stuff. And I'm willing to bet that most patients that don't take the medications, aside from costs, it has to do with how they make them feel. Thanks, Gisela. Your story is, is poignant. And I think that you brought up um, there at the end is so important um, for this audience to hear about the impact. Uh, because when Dr. Leventhal had um, presented about the, the self-management issues and, and the, the not taking the meds and compliance, I hate that word compliance, but, um, but I have to say, I thought to myself, I bet this is around steroids. Um, and I bet it's around, you know, maybe it's tacro because it makes people nauseated and they don't, and they can't eat. And, um, and so in my mind, you know, working at Nefcare and then also being a patient parent myself, I, I have to say, um, you know, if there is anything I can do to prevent my own child from going back on high dose steroids, just like you said, Gisela, I would do it. We've heard time and time again from other patients as well that I, yeah, I would rather go in for another biopsy than start high dose steroids without knowing if something is actually going on. So Gisela, you speak um, the voices of many people and we appreciate you being here. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Udani. I know we've had some questions in the chat. Um, if we want to uh, maybe get Dr. Java in on some of the conversation here. Dr. Udani, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, no, there's some great questions in the chat and uh, I know we've, we're a little short on time, but I think if people can stick around for a little while, we can. Um, so I just wanted to tackle a couple of the early questions. Um, does the degree of HLA mismatch play a role in those who lost chimerism? And was the instance of de novo DSA in those who maintain chimerism different to compare to those that lost it? I think that's probably a question for Dr. Leventhal best. Sure, sure. So no, we, we haven't seen any relationship between the degree of HLA match and the establishment of chimerism. And we've actually looked at this in both directions. We, we looked at the, you know, uh, we, we've had, and, and we've also been using some of the more um, recently described uh, molecular mismatch-based approaches to look at things like eplets, um, which are, are all the rage right now in kidney transplant, looking at the uh, recipient versus the donor and the donor versus the recipient to see if it would predict engraftment or 
uh, predict the development of graft versus host disease. And it did not appear as if um, that the degree of HLA disparity at either the loci or molecular level was predictive. And so uh, secondly, uh, we've not seen any DSA develop in any of the patients who engrafted and came off of immunosuppression. And so the establishment of durable chimerism uh, protects against the development of donor-specific antibodies uh, and also seems to predict, predict is associated with pre protection against disease recurrence. I do want to talk about that disease recurrence thing, uh, as, aspect of things, because with chimerism and this new immune system, that may be at the root of why we don't see disease recurrence, whereas in there's another type of tolerance, and I think it's important to know that there are different roads to tolerance. One is through chimerism, but there's another way of establishing tolerance through immunomodulation, what's called operational tolerance. And this is what the folks at Stanford have advocated. It's what the MGH group has also been advocating, where they achieve not durable, but very transient chimerism, and then depend on sort of a reshaping of the recipient's remaining immune system through regulation, be it Tregs or Bregs or other regulatory cell populations. Now, in those patients with operational tolerance, they have seen disease recurrence and they will exclude patients at high risk with high risk diseases like membranous nephropathy or FSGS. Uh, we've not had to do that. In fact, we've been agnostic to the underlying cause of renal disease and in fact, several of the patients in our trial who had FSGS uh, engrafted came off of immunosuppression, and it's very small numbers, but there may be uh, one of the advantages to a chimerism-based approach is specifically for people with certain types of renal diseases that have a risk of disease recurrence. Excellent. Um, I had a question for both uh, Dr. Leventhal and Dr. Java. Um, you know, this is demonstrated to be a successful trial. What would you anticipate the impact would be on living kidney donor transplants? Would you think would it increase living donation? And would you then anticipate or encourage general nephrologists to counsel their patients differently on the benefits of living donor transplant? So um, you know, I, I think that anything we can do to help increase the number of living donor transplants that we're doing is a benefit, as uh, Gisela mentioned. I mean, this is really, you know, um, the 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 only practical way to get a transplant before you have to go on dialysis. Getting a preemptive transplant is extremely unusual if you're waiting for a deceased donor organ. I mean, here in Chicago, you're waiting seven or eight years if you're a blood group O or A. Gisela's in New York; it's even worse. Um, we'll talk, don't even talk about California. You, so. Uh, but living donor transplants have actually gone down, uh, and I think we have to be doing a better job of educating, and uh, I want to give, you know, Gisela a lot of credit, getting the word out using social media, that, that's something which, you know, people are increasingly doing, there's, there are living donor champion programs out there and organizations, many of these are for people who are recipients who've been through this, or donors, who are trying to help give patients the tools, teach them how to have this dialogue to open up and talk about it because it's amazing when people when you get the word out I mean I we I review these health questionnaires and it's a it, the the response that people get to their stories is it's, it's quite unbelievable and but it's just getting that word out and, and, and it, which seems to be a a roadblock for a lot of folks Anuja yeah, I don't I know what your thoughts are no, I agree. I think it's not a replacement for anything. I think it's an addition. It's going to increase the pool of what we can do for this. You know, but one thought I have, and I kind of want to open it to um, some discussion is that when we are comparing the tolerance protocols, who do you think is like a real competitor group? Is it healthy volunteers? Are those stable patients who've done well? Or are we looking at patients who had chronic rejection? And I think that kind of may help define a little bit um, you know, how we compare this um, to what we do currently and, you know, is it, is it an improvement above and beyond or is it on similar lines? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, there's some real world evidence analysis that, that's been done on the phase two patients, which I didn't talk about today, which, which a much more rigorously defined um, cohort of patients that was recently uh, discussed, uh, presented at the American Transplant Congress that, that I think supports some of the uh, 
a cruder single center analysis that we did showing that there's a benefit in renal function and, and uh, benefit in terms of patient reported outcomes. Uh, but I think this is gonna be really rigorous assessment of this in the phase three trial is very important. And there, you know, the FDA has asked for a concurrent control arm of patients receiving standard of care um, and, and, and with those patients being followed for uh, in, a, in a very rigorous fashion. And that's what it's really going to require from a regulatory perspective. Um, now, you know, you could argue, could you choose a, 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 a historical cohort um, of control patients, uh, but the FDA has been insistent on having a, a, a contemporary contemporary cohort uh, for these studies, and uh, that's ongoing. And so, the pandemic has unfortunately had a real chilling effect on clinical research in general, unless it happens to be trials of SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. uh, so, getting patients enrolled into these sort of interventional trials, we've been stymied a little bit. Um, so, I don't think that we're Right now, we're where we want to be in terms of patient enrollment um, uh, overall. So, but as we're sort of hopefully coming to a point where we can deal with this, for lack of a better way of describing it, um, more successfully, we'll see an uptick uh, in enrollment. And it's going to take the comparison you're alluding to of mm -hmm. not. Um, I think they 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 want to see if there's a benefit against your exactly. best your best immunosuppressively managed patient. And that's the comparison that they want. That's the one. Okay. That's helpful. A couple other uh, questions about the trial. Um, why does it have to be the first kidney transplant? Can you comment on that? And then well, yeah, the so areas... um, you oh. let me um let let me uh, mention address that. So in fact, in the phase two study, two of the patients in the study um, were retransplants uh, and um, who had gotten pediatric kidney transplants and got retransplanted. Interestingly enough, with living unrelated transplants uh, in, in the phase two study. And both of these individuals have come off of immunosuppression and have done very well. Um, and I, I, I do believe there, there may have been a protocol modification addressing retransplant, but as originally, uh, it, but I may be wrong on that and would defer to my colleagues from Tolaris. I thought there might've been uh, a modification to the study to allow a second transplant as long as you weren't sensitized uh, above uh, that, that 80%. Um, there, I saw a question in the chat about graft versus host disease. And so again, I just want to mention you know, there were two cases of graft versus host disease in those 37 subjects in the phase two trial. Uh, one of those patients succumbed to GVH. The other patient um, where it was diagnosed promptly uh, a patient who was here in Chicago uh, was successfully treated and has come off of immunosuppression and has been off of immunosuppression now uh, for more than five years. Um, I think what, you know, so GVH, it, if promptly diagnosed and intervened in, it can be treated, but sort of like rejection, if it's diagnosed late and it gets, the horse gets out of a stable and, and, and into the meadow, it's very, very hard to, to, to get them back. So, um, what we've learned from the phase two trials is that we really need to uh, uh, have a very robust long-term follow-up with patients. Um, we keep the cl being close to the transplant center for you know three to four months, and having you know touch points with the patient on a regular basis, at least weekly, um, which we've learned from this experience in the phase two. And so I, I'm, I'm seeing here in the chat that you can, uh, in for the Freedom 1 and Freedom 2 studies, you can be a recipient of a second renal transplant uh, so long as the individuals um, don't have BK and, and don't have, um, uh, or aren't sensitized against the, um, the donor specifically or have a PRA above 80%. Excellent. Uh, a couple other questions about, a little bit more about the, um, conditioning regimen and the, um, the sort of approach. How do you compare the different techniques to each other? Total lymphocyte irradiation, co stimulatory blockade, lymphocyte depletion, uh, those kinds of things in terms of um, conditioning. Right. So, it, so that you know, the, the so called FCR approach is one of uh, several different approaches to tolerance induction that are being uh, actively explored in the clinic. Uh, 
uh, the pioneers in this area that, that uh, presage the FCR approach include, uh, as I mentioned, Stanford, which is used as TLI-based approach uh, that the late Sam Strober has advocated for decades. And it's proven to be extremely effective in HLA identical kidney transplant patients, but it has failed to work in any degree of HLA mismatch uh, reproducibly. They've not been able to achieve um, uh, the, the induction of tolerance. And the goal of the Stanford approach was to, is to achieve a certain degree of, of stable uh, chimerism uh, in the patients for a certain period of time in the HLA identicals um, and with some degree of mismatch. They've been able to do it with perfectly matched, but uh, not in, uh, in any degree of mismatch. And the Stanford approach has been advanced by a company known as Meteor Therapeutics in a phase three trial that's been completed uh, that was able to reproduce uh, Stanford single center results. But the question is, how broadly applicable is this if it's only HLA identicals? The MGH-based approach, uh, it, which has looked at haploidenticals, uh, was modeled after their work in myeloma patients for uh, kidney uh, and stem cell transplant to treat myeloma and myeloma-induced renal failure. Um, they have had some success uh, in getting patients off of immunosuppression, but I don't think that mechanistically we understand entirely the nature of the operational tolerance, although it appears to be an association in the induction of, of alloreactive regulatory T cells and uh, the development of, of deletion of alloreactive effector cells in those patients. But these operational tolerance-based approaches um, in the absence of sustained chimerism, uh, suffer from the lack of validated biomarkers to let you know when tolerance has been established and to, I would argue, confidently and comfortably follow the patients to be ensured that the tolerance is stable over time. And that's a challenge for non-chimeric-based uh, approaches to tolerance induction is that we don't have biomarkers to uh, sort of rationally guide the withdrawal of immunosuppression and continued avoidance of immunosuppression in patients over time. Uh, and uh, that's gonna be an important companion to uh, non-chimeric uh, approaches to tolerance induction. Uh, both myself and my patients sleep very well at night knowing that as we measure the chimerism, which is a very easy blood test to do, um, that can be done um, very readily and you get the results of in a couple of days, if, as that goes, so goes the tolerance uh, if, if that chimerism is stable. And um, we now, again, we have patients now out more than a decade uh, off of immunosuppression and that tolerance if stable out to a year, that's been highly predictive of it being stable uh, for the foreseeable future. And even among chimerism, Dr. Leventhal, isn't, don't the techniques kind of define whether you're trying to achieve full versus, you know, mixed chimerism and then um, what, you know, what are the pros and cons of one from what yes. I understand? Yeah. That's a very good question, Anuja. You, you know, the, the, our initial value proposition was that this approach uh, using the FCR would achieve a, achieve a state of durable chimerism. What we actually saw in the, in 23 of the 26 patients in the phase two is they, they achieved a very, very high level of donor chimerism by and we use a test called STR analysis, shorthand mm -hmm. or repeat analysis. Mm -hmm. That has a sensitivity of around three to 5%. And what we saw is that uh, whole blood as well as T cell chimerism, and those are the two compartments most places look at in stem cell programs, was greater than 98%. Now you could say, well, they're full donor chimeras. Well, in the peripheral blood, you can make that argument. Right. We actually know that those patients still have residual host immunity that's maintained. Mm -hmm. And we know this because vaccination protect, protective immunity against certain pathogens from childhood mm -hmm. vaccines was maintained in those patients. Right. So we actually had patients who received uh, stem cell transplants from hepatitis B naive donors who had protective immunity against hepatitis B Mm -hmm. because they got vaccinated because they were going on dialysis and they maintain their hep B immunity despite being quote unquote full donor chimeras by STR analysis in the peripheral blood. And so it's a little bit of a misnomer. 
Now, people have talked about mixed chimerism being safer because mm -hmm. it, um, it carries with it a lower risk of graft versus host right. disease. Yeah. But there are two things about mixed chimerism. One is that in the stem cell community, they dread it because it, it is a very unstable condition that sometimes mm -hmm. requires immunosuppression to maintain the donor and graft and because it can be lost. Mm -hmm. it defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do here to get people off of immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. Second is that you can, you can still get graft versus host disease with mixed chimerism. So there's a lower incidence, but it's by no means complete, completely protects you, if you will, from the potential development of graft versus host disease. Um, and I think that it, in the final analysis, any of these approaches needs to minimize the risk of, of, of graft versus host disease uh, of the sort that is severe and untreatable. Okay. My own position on this as a clinician is that, and I think for the wide set, widespread dissemination of, of these approaches where you get higher level of engraftment in, in is um, that if we see GVH, it needs to be mild and treatable. The same way that most rejection we see um, by one year uh, is, is mild and treatable uh, with a few downstream consequences. And there have been advances in the diagnosis and management of, of graft versus host disease in the stem cell community with the emergence of things like the JAK inhibitors, which have really uh, uh, changed the landscape of, of GVH. It's no longer your, your father or mother's GVH that we're seeing in, in 2022 compared to what was seen uh, in the 90s and even the early 2000s. Right. No, personally, in my opinion, I think that if we can get to that sweet spot where, you know, we can avoid GVHD, but even if the patient can't come off full immunosuppression and it's minimal, but they still have enough immunocompetence to fight infections, I think we've still gone ahead from where we are today. So, you know, in my opinion, even if that, I mean, I, I'm sure some patients will completely come off, but even those who don't fully come off, but they're able to reduce to significantly minimal levels is, is a success. Well, that's a very good point. In fact, there are other cell therapies that are under consideration for use in, in, in solid organ transplant, uh, and, and specifically uh, regulatory cells like regulatory T cells and earlier on uh, regulatory B cells that I think most of us feel will never let you get people entirely off of immunosuppression, but may allow you to achieve immunosuppression minimization and you know, I guess using a baseball analogy, maybe you don't hit a home run getting someone entirely off, but if you can hit a thing, get a, a double or a triple, get someone down from three drugs to two drugs or one drug, that might be um, of benefit uh, to, to patients. Uh, and again, it, we'll have to see how those are, those, and these cell therapies are a much earlier stage of, of, of clinical assessment. There is a question by Dr. Randhava actually that actually even I had in mind. Um, so Neil, if you don't mind, it was about a, a biopsy actually, whether we've done biopsies on these patients. Um, you know, I think something that you alluded to earlier was between true and operational tolerance and whether we know what these biopsies look like. Yeah, or sure. So, so we've done protocol biopsies. They were built into the study um, um, at uh, six months, a year and two years. And in the patients who've come off of immunosuppression, the biopsies have been, um, have been, you know, they've been, you know, good looking biopsies, um, no evidence of rejection, no evidence of subclinical rejection. Um, interestingly, in some of the transiently chimeric patients um, uh, who uh, had sort of like immune functional analysis of of, of hyper-responsiveness, which is something that people have been advocating would allow you to wean immunosuppression. Uh, a couple of those patients, and we published this back in 2013, a couple of those patients who had um, hyper-responsiveness by an in vitro assay, when we did uh, a, a protocol biopsy, actually had subclinical uh, BAMP1A rejection. And so we uh, stopped weaning their immunosuppression. So it speaks to the importance of of having, you know, validated uh, biomarkers. Um, uh, and I, I think in, uh, Gisela mentioned how she'd be willing to have a bio, a, a biopsy to help, you know, guide the use of immunosuppression um, specifically related to disease recurrence. Um, this speaks to how, you know, uh, operational tolerance needs something um, non-invasive to guide the, the management of the patients. 
Otherwise, you're looking at doing a biopsy on a fairly regular basis to know whether or not your patients are getting into trouble. This is a fantastic discussion. I know that uh, we're all very excited about this technology and, and I'd love to hear more about it. I do think we'll have to wrap up so we are over time, but I uh, very much want to thank uh, Dr. Levendahl, Dr. Java, Kristen Gisela uh, on being here today, presenting your stories, information, um, and definitely, like I said, looking forward to hearing more from this, uh, this area and this trial because it really is game changing. So thank you all. Um, enjoy your Sunday and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you.